Aloha, welcome to Fast, Healthy, and Ono Cooking. My name is Lonnie Taylor, and I am an AARP Hawaii volunteer. Tonight, I will be your host. Tonight, we will continue our virtual journey around the Mediterranean with a stop in Spain. Spain is famous for paella, a rice dish, which comes from a region called Valencia. Paella is a rice dish served in coastal towns and most popular foods with tourists. And that's what the chef will be making tonight. On behalf of our sponsors, Kaunoa Senior Services on Maui, Ua, Le, Ua Leaf Cafe at Windward Community College, and AARP Hawaii, welcome. For those of you who are new and unfamiliar with AARP, we are a membership organization for people 50 and older, but what we do, we do for everyone. We hope that with this series, you can learn some techniques that you can use to build or maintain a healthy lifestyle. Let's do a quick bit of housekeeping. This is a picture of what you should be seeing at the bottom of your screen the Zoom screen and a PC and possibly the top of your screen on an iPad. Everyone is on mute. If you want to submit a question or comment, please click on the button that says Q&A and type in your question. I will be monitoring the questions and making sure they get asked. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you may type your questions in the comments. We won't be using the raise hand command because questions will be submitted in the Q&A. The chat command also isn't necessarily going to be needed unless you want to commun communicate a technical issue. Alice Swift, Dave DeWitt, and Jackie Bolin are standing by to help. Again, if you want to submit a question or a comment to the chef, please use the Q&A. We recommend that you select speaker side by side view in, rather than gallery for this presentation. To do this by clicking on the upper right part of your screen, once you are in the view, you can change the size of the slides or the speaker simply by clicking and dragging on the middle bar. Finally, we have added closed captioning to this presentation. For those who have difficulty hearing, you can turn this off on your end by checking CC Live Transcript. Button in the lower right side of your screen and clicking on Hide Subtitle. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Chef Daniel Swift, who will be leading us through this cooking series. Over to you, Chef. Voila, can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Sorry, my mouse. I need to clean my glasses <laughs> so I can see better. Uh, thanks, Lonnie, for the introduction. Um, Tonight we're doing uh, paella, and it is, uh, as was mentioned, a, a classic Spanish uh, dish. Uh, the recipe that was sent out was for uh, Valencia. I put on the recipe uh, seafood, which is traditionally not in uh, paella Valencia. It usually has rabbit. We don't have rabbit that, um, well, it's probably, it's probably available actually. I think we're, we're house sitting for someone's rabbit here in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Hopefully Dorothy's not watching, but you know maybe we wouldn't get the rabbit back. But uh, uh, traditionally it would be the rabbit uh, and chicken. Uh, a lot of times it has butter beans in it or fava beans, um, green beans even, uh, but not the seafood per se. But um, for us uh, in Hawaii, we eat a lot of seafood and the, the real meat of what we're talking about in terms of the dish itself is sort of in the technique and then of course in the, the key ingredient, which is the saffron that will go into it. Uh, so variations, and there's lots of different ones out there. Feel free to utilize, like I say every week, what you have on hand. It's really more the technique, and in this case, um, the saffron. So really quick, let's highlight that. Uh, saffron threads, this is a, a one ounce container. You don't normally see this in the store. Uh, we would buy this from our restaurant suppliers. It may be available at Chef Zone or some of the other larger um, box type stores. And 
in, in this quantity, but otherwise you'll be finding it probably just in the small jar. And it is the world's most expensive spice by weight. And, you know, you can see here, one ounce is um, a pretty good size bag. This is actually, I've had this uh, for, for quite a while. I think this only actually ran about $75. It might be $100 today, who knows, but uh, somewhere in that ballpark area, it's a lot more economical to purchase it in bulk, maybe share it with your, your friends, but it's extremely fragrant. Uh, each one of these uh, threads, it's basically saffron threads. And for those of you who are gardeners, uh, each one of these threads is just the stigma of a crocus flower. So with only three of them growing in each flower and with each of them being hand-picked, that contributes to why the uh, this particular spice is so expensive. It's very labor intensive and it's smaller yield. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get it and get together that much uh, saffron. So a couple other little things that I've written up here. Uh, it is, if you're into gardening, it, it's uh, from the crocus uh, sativus flower. And those are the stigmas that are picked off from there. They're really, really nice, fragrant. Um, as I mentioned, it is the most expensive spice by weight in the world, has been for a long time. Um, probably not the most popular, certainly, but definitely the most expensive. Um, it's got a light earthy fragrant to me. It's a sort of, I, I mean, sometimes I guess maybe a little bit floral. Uh, I love the smell. I love the taste of it. Uh, I do remember having a roommate when I was cooking uh, uh, saffron rice. He came home and he couldn't stand the smell actually ran out of the house, thought it was something horrible. Uh, kind of like I experienced durian for the first time. It was something that uh, I was foreign to me and I didn't enjoy it as much. So uh, it is maybe a love or hate kind of relationship type thing with that. Um, it lends itself well uh, to coloring dishes. You'll see that rice will take on a nice yellow uh, orange uh, uh, color as well as the aroma and the flavors. Uh, and then I put that it's used in a lot of traditional classic dishes around the Mediterranean. And this is the Spanish dish that you would find. Uh, there's a um, classic uh, risotto dish that also has it, which is the dish that we did last week uh, with some saffron in it uh, and a couple other ingredients. And then bouillabaisse, base, which is a French uh, Southern uh, Mediterranean dish with a lot of seafood and the saffron in it. So. You know, it's been adopted by a lot of different uh, cultures. It's got primarily, they think, from um, their region around Iran. Uh, the Greeks use it a lot also. So uh, it's been around for a long time. As long as we've been cooking, they've been using this. So uh, hopefully, if you've not tried it before, you might pick some up. Uh, if you need some and you're in the neighborhood, uh, give me a call. You can swing by. I'll give you a pinch of this. Because I think I've had it for like five years or more. Um, so that's the saffron. And then the other ingredients for the one that we're doing tonight uh, has you know, some seasoned chicken. And what I have here is chicken thigh. And I, I purchased a pack with thigh and uh, leg. So what I did was I kept the leg as well. It's got the bone in, but I took the end off and cut them in half. You'll see that as I season them and start to sear them. Uh, of course, some olive oil. This is actually Spanish olive oil. So uh, that's appropriate. We happen to have one bottle of that. Here. Uh, I've got some uh, pork sausage that I'm going to use. And then the other spices, uh, garlic, paprika, and some thyme. This is dried thyme. It could also be fresh thyme if you happen to have some. We have lemon thyme in the garden. I thought about actually picking some of that, but uh, I forgot, to be honest. Um, and then, of course, the saffron will go in. And then we have the rice. And this rice is a short grain, very similar. Uh, this is a boreo, but the rice that's traditionally used for this dish is a short grain rice and it's a starchy rice. So it will thicken up a little bit, not unlike what we did last week, though I did wash it. So some of the starches were taken off of it. Uh, this one I actually soaked a little bit, hoping that it would cook a little more quickly tonight because we have that short time frame uh, for the show. Uh, and then uh, traditionally, uh, I like to put peas and carrots because they're fresh, they're vibrant, they'll go in at the end and they'll maintain that nice color and add to the presentation of the dish uh, prior to service. And then I've also put on uh, the recipe a sort of seafood. It's traditionally, like I said, what you would see. I didn't find any mussels at the store yesterday, but what I got was some 
uh, white fish, some shrimp, some calamari, or our squid. Uh, we have a dish coming up on squid, I think in a week or two. Uh, so we'll be going through that and how to prepare that. And then I got some plans. So they also generally, or more often than not, you can find a bag of like assorted seafood. They were out of it at this uh, times that I went to, but uh, if you can find that, then you don't have to buy all the additional ones. Uh, but mussels would have been a great addition to this as well. And then just the stock necessary to cook the, uh, the rice, obviously. So I've got the pot on here. And then I also set up uh, at St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. I totally forgot. Time flies. This week's my wife's birthday. So that was my priority. I remembered that. So I was good. Um, and then I forgot uh, St. Patrick's Day. But uh, I have a setup. She's laughing over here. Um, for a quick corned beef and cabbage, I'll hopefully try to squeeze that in. We'll see how things go. So hopefully we can do it. I'm going to turn that pan on as well. Just on the right. So this is heating up. Uh, that being uh, nice and warm, I chose a, a wide, flat, uh, shallow pan for this. They do make a special pan that's usually used for paella and it's sort of uh, usually carbon steel. It's really, really wide, flat, and it has the slightly sloped sides of only about two inches, maybe three inches. And oftentimes this is done over an open fire. So this is a really good traditional, fun family type of dish uh, that's enjoyed all throughout the world. And tonight we're just gonna do it like home style. So I'm just gonna season the chicken uh, with salt and pepper. I don't need anything special. And then I'm gonna brown it with the sausage and the, in the olive oil, and then start adding my vegetables. So if you have any questions, feel free, Ronnie, just let me know. Okay, I do have a couple of questions uh, from Cheryl Ann. Can I substitute the shellfish for fresh salmon because my Ohana and I are allergic to shellfish? And what are fresh herbs that can be used at the end of the paella presentation? Yes, you can substitute anything you want. Um, that's no problem. If you don't like shellfish or you're allergic to it, and a lot of people are, uh, just substitute it for the things that you and your family enjoy. Uh, and then for herbs, I would just go with like kind of the neutral ones, right? Any of your sort of earthy ones, um, which would tie in well with the earthiness of the saffron uh, would be good. So thyme, uh, rosemary, marjoram, any of the ones that you might find in a blend for uh, Italian herbs would be good for that. And, you know, if, even if you don't like rabbit or chicken or, you know, uh, the trick that I find that you want to kind of work on is just to make sure that everything comes together uh, at the same time. I cook to perfection. You don't want to add your peas and carrots at this stage. You've got chicken in here that's going to take uh, probably 15 minutes to cook. The rice is going to take close to that. So you wouldn't want to throw your shrimp in in the beginning because by the time the dish is done, it will be completely overcooked. So that's really the, to me, the trick to this dish and a lot of the dishes that we cook is trying to make sure that we cook it so that each ingredient that's in the dish comes out perfect and cooked to perfection at the time of service. So that's really the hard part of making a good meal and then getting it to the table quickly uh, when the salad's being delivered as well or any other items that are being delivered with that particular meal. So everything, each dish is cooked to perfection. Uh, that's really the hard part. So, and this isn't as hot as I thought it would be. I turned it up all the way, but this is a thick pan. It could have been heated up a lot more, but you can see it's starting to brown. I'm gonna add the sausage as well. That's already cooked. So I don't need a lot of uh, color on that or a lot of cooking to it, but I wanna make sure that the chicken gets done all the way. And go ahead if you have other questions too. Okay, uh, Terry wants to know, can you find Spanish chorizo locally? Hmm, that's a great question. I, I have not seen it, uh, but it may be uh, at Whole Foods. I don't shop at some of your finer uh, establishments. I probably should, but uh, you might be able to find it locally at a place like that. Alice is shaking her head yes, so. 
Um, probably out there somewhere at one of those stores. And if not, ask your butcher and maybe they could see about bringing it in if they don't have it in stock. Natividad wants to know, what is the difference between Pelea, Valencia, and Arroz Valenciana? Arroz Valenciana. Yes. So is that the dish we did previously? I'm thinking. No, I, I'll look it up while you guys are cooking. Yeah, I've not heard of that dish. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, Jackie will answer it for us and we'll all learn something. <laughs> Okay. And even the uh, the risotto, melon, I think it's it's mel melanese, whatever the term for people that live in Milan is, uh, Milanese, uh, that's the risotto with the saffron uh, in it. So lots of variations of all of these dishes uh, that we prepare. It's just based on a regional preference and tradition. So are you ready for that answer? So, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, go for it. The major difference between paella and arroz valenciana is the manner of preparation and the ingredients. While arroz valenciana is basically cooked on the stove, paella is baked using special ingredients such as wine, seafoods, vegetables, and the expensive spice saffron. Oh, is that the, that's the difference right there. <laughs> that's, that's what they say the difference is. And, and also, uh, while, while, I, while we're on it, Dan, what's the difference between Spanish chorizo and Mexican chorizo? Because they have chorizo at Safeway. Uh, probably the same ingredients, I would guess. More than likely, I, I would venture to say it's probably where it's manufactured or made. Uh, the ingredients and the spice blends that they use in both areas are very similar. Maybe a little more oregano you'd find in uh, Mexico or Latin America. But um, yeah, there's a lot of similarity there for sure. Great question. Thanks for looking that up. Now, normally I wouldn't cover this. Uh, tonight I'm doing it just because I want to expedite the, the cooking process a little bit. And while that's going, I'm going to cut my onions for the corned beef and cabbage. Rosa Sand said you can find the chorizo, Spanish chorizo, um, from Tamura's on Maui, carries it. Oh, okay. Wow. Awesome. Maui. I love Maui. I ought, I'll, maybe I'll talk Alice into flying over with me and we'll pick up some over there. <laughs> and Foodland, she said. So I'm just removing the uh, stem. And for the cabbage, we, we got donated some uh, really, really nice uh, organic um, bok choy. So I'm going to use that in place of the traditional cabbage. So this is a little bit of a Hawaiian style or Chinese style beef and cabbage. So cultural. Very Wait, easy. I think I, I think I was multitasking. Are you making corned beef and cabbage at the same time that you're making paella Valencia? <laughs> I'm just starting it. So this is about ready for us awesome. to go. Sorry. We, we, <laughs> I can't speak in an Irish accent very well, but to all the Irish out there, this is for you. All right. Oh. So I, that, that little bit of time with the lid on there helped produce some steam to help cook the uh, chicken a little more quickly, uh, which is something that we wanted to do. I'm going to hit this one with just a little bit of oil. Chef, what's in the stock? Uh, this is just a vegetable stock tonight. It could be chicken stock, but we didn't have any today, but we had vegetable stock. So that's what we're using here. And that'll go in here shortly with the rice. But what I want to do first is uh, add the garlic the tomato, the saffron, the thyme, and the paprika. So I'm gonna put those in. The garlic, I don't wanna put it in whole. I put chopped on there. So I'm just gonna do a few slices of each clove. If you wanted a whole, you could do that, but because the dish does cook for quite a while, so they would soften up. But I, I find it to be a little overpowering if you get whole holes of cloves of garlic. So I at least give it a little bit of a slice. And then I can stir this around, loosening up the uh, chicken from the pan. You've released a little bit of the fat. I'll move this over now so you guys can see it better. From the uh, sausage. 
This is about as big a pan as we can handle on this burner, I think. But you can see that we'll start to release the aromas and the colors of the saffron and the herbs. I can now add my tomato, spread that around a little bit. Oh yeah, and that will deglaze, as you recall, hopefully from the classes we've done. You get that browning and that fond or caramelization on the bottom of the pot, which is great. Uh, when you add liquid in the form of wine, now, traditionally I probably would put some wine in this at that stage, but uh, we're, we're doing healthy, so we're staying away from that for now. Uh, but that any of those liquids will release the caramelization that's taking place on the bottom of the pan. So now that I've got that, I'm going to just spread the rice around so it's kind of even across the bottom. It's now ready for the stock. And that was two cups of rice. So I'm going about four cups of stock. I can hear this cooking away. There we go. So once I get all of the rice on the pot, a little bit more stock. I don't want a bunch of rice stuck on the side of the pot because then it, it won't get any moisture on it and it won't cook. So we want that, let that come up to a boil. And then I'll probably cover it. I'll keep an eye on it though. And then over here, I'm gonna add my potatoes. And the, the key, if you're cooking in a hurry, and many of you do, I wouldn't wanna be doing large chunks of potato. I wanna make sure that they're cut kind of small, especially if I want this dish done in you know 10 or 15 minutes. So you can cut a potato really small and have it done in about five minutes. It's no problem. It just depends on how large the potato is cut. So I'm going to do just small dices of this. Line those up and they'll cook really quickly. Although traditionally I would do this in a larger format just because I like the big chunks of potato. So we can throw those in. And here I have a little bit of uh, vegetable stock as well. I'll add all these potatoes. I know Jackie was sad that we didn't have corned beef and cabbage, so we're, we're getting it today. Or sort of, actually. The strong. I was more remorseful that we hadn't clued in on the date and gone Irish for today. <laughs> yeah, well, we could have done the Northern Atlantic. When we do that, it'll be salmon and all of the traditional stuff. Maybe we could do haggis or something from Scotland. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure a lot of people like haggis, but it's sheep stomach. For those that might not know, the stomach itself is like stuffed with the blood and oat and spice mixture and then cooked and you eat it out of the Stomach lining, it's interesting. Uh, and then I threw together, We you can pick up for the blend of spices. Uh, if you're making corned beef yourself, you can pick that up um, in the supermarket. We did our own blend because we didn't think to add it until later on um, in, the, in the morning, this morning. So uh, I have here a bay leaf, mustard seed, peppercorn, some anise, um, Cardamom pods is the only thing I didn't have in stock, so that's not in here. Uh, ground coriander, crushed red pepper, ground ginger, and I'm going to add a crushed piece of uh, lemongrass. We've been using this a few times. I had one left over. I'm going to just kind of crush the. And if you recall, or if you tuned in for the class that we had when we had uh, the professor from University of Hawaii going through all the details about lemongrass, really informative. And kind of, you know, if you've used that a lot, you can imagine that flavor going really well with uh, corned beef. Uh, in this case, as I said, uh, we had a package of pastrami. So that's what I'm using. It's similar to corned beef. It's just cut differently. And as opposed to being boiled, traditionally it's smoked uh, and then steamed. 
So you get a similar flavor when you're dealing with it. Um, but we happen to have one pack. And that's what I'm doing. And this is sliced thin. So honestly, and because it's cooked already, I could just lay it on top and steam it. It would be done. But I want that flavor into the uh, into the dish. So I'm going to put it on top and kind of spread it around. Was that a question, Lonnie, do you have, or no? And I'm gonna add a little more stock, keeping an eye on my clay over here. Because you, you want a little bit of broth in the end when you're done, or I do, I kind of like a little bit. I'll usually mash my large chunks of potato and soak up some of that liquid. So with that, those spices, make sure that they're sort of submerged so it'll start to like pull all of those flavors out of it and into the dish. And then I'm just gonna cover that. Let that come to a boil. Because remember, if we're cooking starches, whether it's uh, the rice that we have here in the paella, whether it's uh, a potato that you're boiling, or any starch, corn, cornmeal that you're cooking, tapioca, any starches, they need to come to a temperature of like 195. It varies, but, but once you hit 195 degrees, you're done. All of your starches will be cooked at an internal temperature over 195. So when we bring something up to a boil, then we know we're safe and we have reached uh, the temperature that is necessary to cook the starch that's in the ingredients. So, uh, this lid is in a great fit. You can see it's sort of overflow, or maybe you can see it's flowing over a little bit. I'm going to move this over. That's a nice pan, but I don't have the lid for it. Uh, this one's getting uh, pretty close. It's starting to absorb uh, the, the moisture. I can always use a slotted spoon if I wanted to come back to it and pull some of the rice up and see where we're at in that. And that'll get pretty close. Did you have any other questions at the moment, Lonnie? Um, Lonnie got kicked off, so I'll go ahead and ask a couple of questions. So, um, well, Holly just wants to comment that for corned beef, she uses a pressure cooker. Um, and she's assuming that you could do that or an instant pot versus a pot on the stove. And I can yeah. personally attest to the instant pot because that, that's what I use to cook mine in. But yeah, no question. Uh, absolutely much faster. Uh, if you have time, you go old school and you can use the, the you know, just an old crock pot uh, that cooks low and slow overnight, but a pressure cooker and the instant pot or Insta pot, uh, which is a brand, I think, but um, they expedite the process so much more. It, this would cook in, I don't know, probably 15 minutes. Uh, the trick you got to be careful with is to make sure that you're uh, not turning your potatoes and vegetables and cabbage to mush while you're cooking your corned beef, so. And then of, is uh, tomato us sauce usual for paella? This person doesn't remember that from the last time they had it. Uh, usually it's, it could be fresh diced tomato. There usually is tomato in it, um, but it doesn't have to be canned tomato. Uh, that's what I use tonight, I tend to like that, but uh, it's up to you, but normally, yeah, diced tomato would be used in this dish uh, as well. And if you wanted to leave that out and didn't want that flavor, that would be fine. And then for this one, I, I am going to taste the broth just to make sure. Good flavor. Uh, that we're where we want to be with the saffron. Because this is quite a bit. It's about double the recipe, I think, that I, that I wrote. So I'm, it's, it's, it's in there, but I'm gonna add a little bit more. And that's a subtle flavor that comes through after. Um, it's like a, we have what we call first, second and third or secondary and third level tastes. So sometimes you taste something and you don't get the flavor of it and it takes it a, a second or two. And then other things take a little bit longer than that. Saffron is one of those, it takes like a second or third level taste. So it takes a second to come through. And then Holly's, uh, Holly's uh, asking about different recipes for paella, depending on which part of Spain you're in. Because we know that 
uh, seafood paella is very popular in coastal towns and paella Valencia is more of a farm area paella, but do you happen to know, Dan, if there are different types of paella depending on your region of Spain? There are, yes. Uh, like the Valencia, you just spelled it out exactly right. So it, we, it's kind of weird for us to think about it today, but a lot of the dishes that are traditional um, were based on economics and based on transportation and what was grown locally. So, you know, in the old world, you would come across the items that uh, were developed and traditionally made because those are the items that are local, right? If you're growing uh, rabbit or pork, and we talk about pork, we don't do a lot of pork here, but I almost thought about putting a little bit of, like I had some uh, pork spare ribs, some small ones put in here, but I don't wanna go crazy, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. The different regions and the things that are grown there locally, like here at Windward, this region was famous for, or traditionally growing um, uala leaf or uala, sweet potatoes. So there's a specific varietal that did really well here, you know, a hundred years ago. So that's part of why we call the cafe the uala leaf cafe. But you always go with the stuff that's local and fresh. You couldn't fly things out. You couldn't, you know, uh, jump on a train necessarily uh, till the what mid 1800s. So yes, it's always traditionally uh, regional based items. A little bit different today. You want a strawberry, you can get it 365 days a year, but that wasn't the case <laughs> uh, before. And I, my understanding is that it was the tourists who made paella, seafood paella so popular and now it's one of the most popular forms of paella around the world so uh, we have power we can't pronounce things but we can we can make things popular <laughs> uh, so laura laura wants to know um does saffron have a pretty long shelf life um you mentioned you had yours for five years is it still good is it still orangey red in color <laughs> hers yeah. is brownish well, I was reading the box and it, there's different grades to it. And this is just a medium quality grade one, uh, which is probably why it was only $75. But um, uh, it also had the expiration date or the best best before is the term that is more often used these days. And it says best before like 2016. So uh, it's all, but the flavor, uh, basically like any dry spice, you're just gonna lose a little bit of the strength, right? Uh, this is in a Ziploc, it was unopened. It was in a tin that was wrapped and unopened. So as soon as I opened it, it was really fragrant. Um, but I don't know, I grew up poor and we ate whatever. And um, in the kitchens today, especially for me, I, I try to get the most out of everything. And if I have to use twice as much of the saffron to get the traditional flavor of a fresh harvested one, uh, it's better than throwing it away. So. Yeah, you just as, want to as do, long as that's not your yeah. medication, we're okay with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not promoting any. Uh, Don't do that with your medication. Um, if we have an, a request on the Irish side of things, if you could please repeat the seasonings for the corned beef and cabbage. Yeah, I had uh, the lemongrass, which I threw in, but uh, mustard seed, uh, fennel, uh, peppercorns. Uh, I didn't have the black cardamom, uh, uh, salt. Uh, what else was on my list? Bay leaf. Um, there's a couple other things. Did you get that down, Alice? You could type it in the chat or no? Probably have that list. Well, it's getting hot now. So that's actually getting really close. Uh, but that was most of it. You can find uh, recipes out there for creating your own spice, and they do vary a little bit, but. Um, if there's one in there that you don't like necessarily the flavor of, you could admit that and just go with the ones that you do like. And don't most corned beef packages come with the spices in there already? Yeah, yeah, most of them do. That was pastrami, so that's why we didn't have one. Mm. Um, someone gave me late notice at 10 this morning. That was you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, and then I have the, uh, you can see the rice is getting, or hopefully you can see the rice is getting very close. To absorb most of the moisture. There's still a little bit here, which I, I, I honestly don't like it super dry and clumpy. Some people might like it like that. I prefer to have it a little bit uh, with a little bit of moisture, not like a soup, but with some moisture to it. So I'm going to turn this down. And there's actually some moisture from the thawed shrimp from the clams that I opened up and the fish and the calamari. I don't really want to put that cold liquid in here because it'll throw off the ratio, but I can add the 
shrimp and the clams and the peas and carrots. And then I'm gonna put a lid on it, give it a couple minutes to, to cook these items and we'll be set. And I like to leave these, once you put the, if you're presenting it whole, uh, leave these on top and not sort of stir them in so that when they're, when they're cooked and the dish is presented, and it looks uh, beautiful with all of the, the seafood or the rabbit or whatever, the chicken sticking out. But anything that you're putting on towards the end, try to make sure that it doesn't get stirred in. It keeps that beautiful presentation. Are there any other questions? There's one question that's more, it's not really a cooking question, but we'll test your knowledge. Um, can you talk about where saffron comes from and, and, and why it's so expensive? Trader Joe's used to have saffron. That's yeah. from Holly. And I remember when I was visiting Zanzibar, which is a place that, where saffron comes from, from that they claimed that it was more expensive per pound than gold. And I don't know if that's true or not. But. Yeah, because it's so light, it, I know that it was at one point. Uh, I don't know, gold's gone up quite a bit <laughs> since I was a young guy. Um, but it, it, as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, and I don't know if you guys can see this flower. I'll try to get it. You know, see that little flower there? That's the flower that grows saffron. And each one of those little flowers is a crocus family. It has three little stigmas. I always thought they were stamens or something, but I didn't remember my like eighth grade biology very well. Uh, but those are all hand picked. So the flowers are first picked by hand and then they're laid out on a table and then people sit down and they pick each individual thread, three per flower and they collect them. And that's a very labor intensive process. So uh, that's what contributes to the, uh, ex the expense of it. And then the origins that I was reading about just brushing up today, uh, like Iran, uh, Mesopotamia area, uh, Greek, I mean, different cultures in the modern era will claim, you know, that something originated where they are. So it's contested a little bit, but um, traditionally in, in that uh, Middle Eastern area for sure is where it popped up. Okay, and, and then this one is a cooking question. So this person thought that one of the attractions of paella is the crispy bottom, which is also what I've read. And your paella is looking a little juicy over there. So yeah, will it end up with a crispy bottom? It can, absolutely. Everything can end up with a crispy bottom if you wanted to. You may, but timing you may wise, would you be waiting to add your shrimp if we weren't doing a 30 minute show? Would you wait until it had crisped? Yeah, if I wanted a crispy bottom, I would still, add, you still need a little bit of moisture in there to cook the shrimp. Um, depending on how you're doing it, if you're doing it over an open fire where you're gonna have some heat coming around the edge of the pan, um, it may not be as necessary, but you have to transfer some heat from somewhere to the shrimp. Um, but if you're looking for the crispy bottom, then you would be putting the shrimp in earlier and you would be probably mixing it in a little bit so that the rice uh, and the other ingredients could kind of encase it and transfer that heat. If they're just sitting on top and you're over an open flame, you're gonna have a hard time getting that cooked, especially once the dish becomes dry. Um, so and, yeah, and yeah, traditionally you would see that. Uh, I just prefer it to be a little bit on the moist side and this will dry up, you'll see it. It's, it's actually, we got five minutes. So we're, we're about right on track. If we were to take this and put it in the oven as that, um... And would that crisp up the bottom? Absolutely. Uh, in the oven, uh, uncovered probably would be recommended. Um, and then you'll get the drying effect on the outer side of the pot, as well as the evaporation from the top. So I would get a crispy bottom if I left this lid off and just continue to cook it until the moisture was gone. I just wanna to try to get those shrimp done in the next four minutes. Um, but it's sort of like the Vietnamese style clay pot rice where it has a crispy bottom on there and they'll like break the pot oftentimes uh, just to serve it in that little cluster. But um, if you want the traditional crispy bottom, then you, you need to cook it. The challenge I have, and you'll see it if you follow the show, um, 
is with a lot of traditional dishes that are great. Don't get me wrong, they taste delicious, but I try to keep the integrity of every ingredient as high a level as possible. So I will guarantee you the crispy bottom paella, the, the shrimp is cooked, uh, uh, overcooked basically. Uh, the chicken that we're using here is a thigh and a leg. So it can take a little overcooking. Rabbit can take a little overcooking. Sausage, no problem. You can't really overcook it necessarily. Um, it's not easy to do anyways. But when you start moving into the seafood arena, it's like tuna. The difference between seared ahi and canned tuna, it's the same fish, but one is super dry. You need mayonnaise, you need all sorts of things with it, otherwise you can't even swallow it. Whereas if you have a nice piece of uh, seared tuna or even a poke and it's medium rare or rare or raw even, it's moist and it's easy to digest. So that's the challenge and the, the happy medium that I always try to find when cooking is like, how do I keep the integrity of the ingredient um, and then honor the traditional dish flavors at least, right? So, and this so is really last thing on that, Dan, could oh. you, if you were doing the oven because you want the crispy bottom, could you yeah. just wait until the last five minutes of cooking and throw the shrimp on top of that? Yeah, absolutely. Or you could even do the shrimp separately. Right, you could poach them in the juice that came uh, with the shrimp. Uh, you could steam them. You could saute them and lay them on top, fresh. Um, any any way to get that shrimp to perfection is up to you. Uh, even grilled, or if you're doing it over an open fire, like it's traditionally done, you could uh, you know skewer those shrimp and cook them over an open fire. So you're getting that flavor as well, and then slide them off uh, at the end. So, and that's the tricky part um, as chefs or and people that work in kitchens professionally all the time, we have that debate. We're always like looking at the way something's been made for, you know, a hundred years or more. And then you're like, oh, but that's just not the best way to, to get the quality out of the product. As Joyce so, wants to add cheese yeah. if we put it in the oven. Um, is that, would that be traditional or just to taste? I've not cheese as in fromage cheese like he doesn't say she just says would you add cheese on top if you're baking the paella i never have seen that but now that you mention it, it sounds pretty good <laughs> <laughs> it sounds what's not good with cheese on it right might not be as healthy yeah but if you look at the like the risotto which is similar with the saffron and seafood the um italian version of the using of saffron with the rice dish uh, that would be more appropriate probably to put the cheese on top. All right. So we, so we is, have, um, we have one more question related to the corned beef, but uh, do you want to finish up the paella? Yeah, I'm going to dish a little bit up. This is, uh, I'm running out of time and burner's not quite working as hot as I was hoping it would. This is a really big pot for, the, for this poor little burner. So good job tonight. Let's just give it a little, they've been very loyal, loyal and work well for us. But I'll dish some up and yeah, go ahead if you have another question. So regarding the corned beef, um, one of the attendees used a multi-cooker crock pot and cooked it on low for 10 hours. Outcome of the four pound product was, a, was porous. Others in the same pot have turned out okay. Could you, would you happen to know why this might've been the case? It turned out porous? Yeah. With holes in it? I don't know. Anonymous, if you'd like to put more in there about that. Porous. Yeah. I would imagine, um, if it's the same pot, the same technique, uh, any difference that you'd run across would come from the product that you purchased. So if it, it would be strange if that was the same manufacturer or processor for the corned beef. And would did, fat dissolve? Could it have been um, highly fatty and the fat might dissolve and just leave the meat after 10 hours? Yeah, I mean, you're going to get a little bit of that, but um, yeah, I, I don't, not enough to where I would think that it would leave pockets, uh, not with corned beef, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. She, he or she is saying that it had holes in it. <laughs> holes, oh, I don't know. That's a really good question. That's a mystery. <laughs> okay. It, I hope it tasted okay. <laughs> We're in the last minute, so I want to, while Chef Dan is scooping up the food to show us, I want to just let everybody know that 
if you didn't get the chance to do a single sign up for the April events, I just put the link into the chat. Um, if you signed up already, don't re-enter. Like if we're the ones that signed you up for these sessions, you don't need to re-enter. But if you missed it, I've modified the form and you can sign up for April. Um, otherwise, you can go to our website at aerp.org forward slash near you and just sign up for individual programs. Um, and Janice Nilsson would like to remind everyone that tonight is a full moon rising at 633 and tomorrow night 729. Um, and Pam speculates that the holes in the corned beef are because of uh, low grade corned beef. That's I was thinking all we've got. It's the, the, the critters that are burrowing holes through it. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Uh, so I just plated this up. And like I said, for me, I, I like to have a little broth. So when I mash my potatoes, I kind of absorb that. Give it in a little taste. Tastes all right, not bad. Uh, so in honor of St. Patrick's Day, we wanted to make sure we throw that in. And, and in looking at this, uh, I didn't measure my stock today, which I should have. Uh, I added a little more stock that was necessary uh, to this dish. That and the, yeah, the process of adding the lid to cook the shrimp and not letting enough escape uh, makes this a little bit wetter than it would be. So that's about right where I like it right now. But for someone who wants it dry, um, it would be a little bit on the wetter side. I would have to continue to cook it, which could overcook the rice a little bit. So you have to be careful in your ratios for sure. So most of those are on the rice that you get. So it'll tell you how much you need. And then if you think about which I didn't think about it. I soaked the rice tonight or today, which means I didn't need as much stock to cook it. So I wasn't thinking that when I poured it in. So even as professionals, we still <laughs> learn every day. So. But the recipe would still work if we follow the recipe, yeah? Yeah, it doesn't mention soaking the rice uh, <laughs> in the recipe. The recipe's fine. It's got the right amount and stuff there. But um, yeah, it's always tough to try to squeeze things in and and Janine says it looks as good as the one that they served her in Madrid. So you must have done something right. <laughs> and I would like, you know, someone had asked earlier about fresh herbs. And, you know, for me, I can never, you can never go wrong with, uh, uh, with parsley, but a little fresh thyme. I mean, if, if you love basil, a little basil on here would be great. Uh, maybe not cilantro, but then again, if you like cilantro and it goes with uh, the dish that you think it goes with, then more power to you. Well, thanks, Chef Dan, and thanks, everybody. I've repasted that link in the chat, so I'm going to leave things on for just a moment if you want to click on that and sign up for April. Otherwise, I hope everyone has a happy St. Patrick's Day and that everyone's wearing green. <laughs> Mahalo. All right. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>